Uh, really appreciate it. Uh, I was actually trying to come to this event to be sitting where you guys are at and relax and learn. But uh, Veronica kind of challenged me. She said, hey, you, you used to be a customer. Now you're working for Cisco. What have you learned? What have, what have you seen? And that's kind of what I want to put out there on the table. By no means is this a gospel. Subject to debate. Happy to do it over some beers later on today. But this is just my take of being here for quite some time uh, at Cisco for about eight years, just talking to different customers and things like that. Now, the usual disclaimer for the legal folks. These are my views, not the views of my employer. But I should have added another disclaimer in here. I went to school and did electrical engineers. So I'm an engineer by trade. Now, I'm going to be talking a lot about business cases. Very uncomfortable for me. And it might be for a lot of you guys. So bear with me. This is the first time this is being delivered. So let's see how it goes. So first of all, I want to take a step back and go down memory lane. So when the first internet came about, which is, we all know as ARPANET, what did it have? It needed to be point to point and it needed to be distributed if part of it didn't work and it needed to be continue working. But what gave it a little bit of resilience was the point to point nature of it. Hey, I'm sending a packet to you, Joao. You send me a packet back. But over time, we started adding all these middle boxes and NAT and CGNAT and all these things that have made it complicated, right? Well, guess what? We're talking about IPv6. IPv6 allows us to bring that end to end back to networks. And that's just from a communication perspective. If you look at what's going on in the IETF, there's a lot of end-to-end -end work happening. We're looking for end-to-end -end encryption, end-to-end -end privacy, end-to-end -end things. So this is a dream that we all have. Now, the, the, the reason I also want to bring this back is because we're going to see this diagram over and over again throughout the presentation. And the goal is to have something to talk, up, talk about. And for illustration purposes, we have clients that want to talk to applications. I'm just calling it the internet for simplicity. And there's the stuff in the middle, which are your enterprise networks. We're all here at Meta using their Wi-Fi network for guests. That's their enterprise network. And we have ISPs that kind of have to get us out there. So keep this in mind, and you'll see it again and again. Now, from an IPv6 perspective, how do you guys think we're doing? At a very high level, I would say clients are pretty much ready today. ISPs are mostly ready, not all of them. So there's a few that still are stragglers out there. We just saw Veronica talk about there's some stragglers in the UK. So let's get our act together. And then the internet, for the most part, the Googles, the Metas, all these services are available for us to get over v6. Now, no surprise, we're struggling with the enterprise. Sorry I'm sing sing singling you guys out, but it is the reality. I mean, I was just talking to some universities out here. They haven't fully deployed it because, again, there's a layer 8 component to it. Hopefully, this talk today will help you find the business justification to help them carry them along. But before we get to the enterprise, let's look at our friends and the ISP and the content providers. What did they do well? What did we learn from them? Now, this is an IPv6 talk. Well, the first answer that comes to mind, because we're all technical in here, yes, they deployed IPv6. Well, yeah, sure, they did that. But we're trying to do, look at things differently here today. We're going to put our business lens on. Again, we're going to start getting uncomfortable. So what did these folks learn, the ISPs, the Googles, the Facebooks? What did they learn? They learned two things. They needed scale, and they needed automation. What do I mean by scale? They needed more customers. If I'm an ISP, I want to get more and more customers. If I'm providing a service, more searches, more whatever. I need to instantiate all these things. I need to be able to do this massively. I want to get to every single human on the earth. And if you think about it, we've already, that surpasses the amount of IPv4 already available if we give each human one of them. Again, excluding that NAT exists and CGNAT and all that stuff. So therein lies the problem. So the business said, we want to solve our problem and we want to get to scale. Well, IPv6 is an answer to help you get there. On the second one, automation. Because we're operating at such large scales, we can't do provisioning every single time somebody wants to add a new service, a new customer, and needs to be fully automated. So you might be thinking, what the hell is he smoking? I, I do live in Amsterdam, so maybe when I walk down the street. But I'm trying to look at it from the business perspective. I'm trying to make it look like, what do they care about? They want to get more customers. They want to do it automatically. 
speed to market, speed to transact. That's what they cared about. And guess what? We got through it because of IPv6. Again, just another way to look at things. Now, I didn't get to this conclusion overnight. There was some rewiring that had to happen. So sometimes I introduce myself as the self-proclaimed IPv6 evangelist. And this is probably many of us sitting in this room, many of the speakers probably went down this path. But it didn't happen overnight. It ca happened over a few years. So let me explain to you what I mean by that. So we've, always, we've all seen this graph. I mean, we just saw it with Veronica. But I'm going to look at it from a different lens. So in the first few years of the, IP, of the internet, when we started deploying IPv6, I would say most of us were enthusiasts. We said, hey, let's go deploy it. Let's see what breaks. Let's see what happens. Let's see who complains. Well, that's what we all were. And then we all sat down, the same 20 people from 20 years ago, discussing the same thing. Well, guess what? That didn't work. We didn't have mass critical following. We were stuck, right? We were always being asked, what is the business case? Why do I need to deploy it? Why do you care? Why did you do it, right? So we were all enthusiasts. So now to become evangelists, we started figuring out what does this business case? What do they care about? What makes them tick? And we just saw earlier ISPs, they needed to solve the problem of scale and automation. Well, V6 is a means to get there. And that's when we started seeing IPv6 start exploding. Again, this is my personal view. You can disagree with it. I'll pass you the mic, but later, not, not right now. And this is what I want to unpack in the rest of the conversation. How do, we, how do we evolve? How do we get to this point? How do you all become evangelists at the end of the day? So let's go back to this diagram. Now we're going to focus specifically on the enterprise. So let's see. So just imagine, again, for argument's sake, it was really hard to figure out one business to, to tackle. So I'm trying to generalize it for everybody in the crowd and for those of you watching online. So just imagine. You are a business. You probably have heard these words somewhere for your entity, no matter which vertical you're on. Hey, we want to modernize our processes and we want to simplify. Just put a words to it. I want to simplify our HR process. I want to simplify how we connect. I want to simplify just fill in the blank. But almost every company, whether public, private, government, has kind of this. But what does this mean to an engineer? This just means I want to reduce my costs. At the end of the day, if you really, really peel the onion, that's what it means. Now, you probably have heard of your businesses talk about new lines of service. That really means for us engineers, new offerings, new ways to interact with people, new things, new toys, whatever. This is what it means. And last but not least, every single company in the world, entity, no matter where you are, you have mandates and you have things to comply with whether you're publicly or privately traded, to do your taxes, to do business, to register your business, all these things. And this just means staying in business. Now, the question I see in all your faces is, what does this have to do with IPv6? Well, let's unpack it a little bit and see what do I mean by that. Let's go on this journey. So first of all, I'm assuming everybody came here because they knew something about IPv6, so I will not cover the basics. However, what I will cover is IPv6 does one thing. It simplifies operations. Well, it gets rid of NAT. I can pretty much get something going without needing all, a lot of servers. I, 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 I mean, just think about DHCP. Typically, we put a big server somewhere. Well, we're all in the business of trying to get servers uh, out of our data center for either for sustainability, uh, cost savings, whatever the reason may be, but IPv6 allows us to do a lot more to get started with very little. That's why I kind of like this tying IPv6 and simplicity together. The other thing too, I used to be a customer, like I mentioned. There was a one point where I was able to get all my old routers to actually consume less memory on my V6 routing table to compare my, my V4 routing table. And again, those are a lot of the inherent things that IPv6 allows you to do with summarization. What does this mean? <coughs> Excuse me. It meant that I can sweat my assets a little bit, meaning I can probably get two, three more years out of that router where I'm saving the business money. I know the salespeople out there might, might hate me, but it's a reality. This is how the business thinks. And IPv6 is a, is a way to start realizing all those benefits, cost savings, reducing the complexity on your business. Now, speaking of cost, let's go on to the next one. 
There's an old friend of ours from back in the Internet 2 days, Mr. Lee Howard, that did a projection in the early 2017, 2018s, where he talked about the cost of IPv4 was going to be going up. Well, guess what? He was right. Now, he did his study only until 2019. So around 2019, an IPv4 address, a single address, not a slash 24, nothing like that, was averaging about $25. Fast forward to today. I took this screenshot over the weekend. It's averaging 35, but probably creeping up, which means if I want to put a new service out there and I'm thinking in terms of V4, it's going to cost you a pretty penny already to do business. And this is per IP address. So again, from a business perspective, cost matters. And to drive the last point home from a business perspective, there's this thing called total cost of ownership that businesses think about. They think about, what does it take to maintain my operations? I know we're engineers. We always say, if it ain't broken, don't fix it. So that's maybe one of the reasons why people don't deploy IPv6, because v4 has been working fine. Well, guess what? There is a cost to maintaining that network running IPv4. There's these big NAT or CG NAT boxes. Uh, they cost money. You have to keep them on. You have to troubleshoot. And when something breaks, this complexity <laughs> does cost money. And sometimes if a business is down for a minute, an hour, that could be thousands or millions of dollars, depending on what vertical you're on. So there is a cost associated with running. The other thing, too, is I, this thing I like to call tainted IPv4. Now, I was one of the lucky ones back before I joined Cisco that I was able to acquire a slash 16 from an X country in the world. I'm not going to disclose it. But I could not use it for over a year because it was blacklisted. We all know that all these ACLs are stagnant, hasn't been cleaned up for all these different services around the world, which meant I just spent a lot of money on a slash 16 that I could not use for a year. And now I have to spend engineering resources to try to call all these people to clean them up to allow me to use it. Well, that's a sunken cost. That is not good for business. They were expecting to deliver a new service and we couldn't deliver, we were delayed by a year. That's not good. That's what the pe business people like, uh, are thinking about. And last but not least, my favorite. Well, it's going to hurt my pocketbook because I do a lot of things in the cloud. They are going to start charging for IPv4. Again, should not be a surprise to anybody in this room. If it is, pay attention. AWS, more specifically, will be charging for IPv4 for anything that you deploy inside your VPCs. So it starts to get real for a lot of people. Now you're your costs are going to start increasing over time because guess what? Go do an audit. See how many services are being run that are just automatically using V4. It'll add up, so pay attention. So probably hit the problem home in terms of cost reduction. So let's look at the next thing, the line of business that I mentioned earlier. So what does that mean? I want to be able to deliver new services, as I mentioned earlier. Now. All these things that you see on the screen are buzzwords, right? Well, guess what? A lot of these buzzwords are things that your C-suite is talking about, your strategy people are start talking about. They're trying to figure out how do I insert our, how do we insert ourselves into one of these things, with or without you. So as IT people, it is in our best interest to get involved, help them out. Because one of the things that all these things have in common, they will be made possible by IPv6, IPv6 as an enabler to get to these things. So let me unpack probably one for as an example in the interest of time. AIML, everywhere, right? Virtual reality, everywhere. I mean, we're sitting in Facebook's headquarters, so I'm gonna hit on that one. So those two, what they have in common is the enemy of their deployments or the implementations is latency. Now, just imagine for any transaction, any experience with virtual reality that we can remove the latency. That's a bonus to make these things reality. Guess what we just kicked off the conversation with? We talked about end-to-end -end communication. IPv6 gives us that. If we can remove one, two, three milliseconds of latency for any of these applications, that translates to into a better experience and making some of these services a reality. Keep that in mind. Again, food for thought. IPv6 as an enabler to make any of these things happen at scale in a simpler way with less cost. Next. Now, 
as much as anybody, I don't like to deal with paperwork. We all hate it. But as an IPv6 evangelist, I've come to embrace all these mandates because it's getting really interesting. All over the world, countries are starting to say, if you want to do business, you have to do IPv6. And by the way, it's not just IPv6. It's IPv6 only for the most of them. China, the US federal government, India, you have to do business with IPv6, IPv6 only. There's just a few countries like Mexico, last in that list, that are, yes, they're coming on board, but they're coming on board with IPv with dual stack, which is okay. I mean, at least they're going down the direction of IPv6. But these mandates, we have to comply. That will, that will trickle down to you as businesses too. If you want to keep the doors open, if you want to pay your taxes, you want to keep your business alive, you have to pay attention to this. And they all have varying degrees of dates associated with them. Uh, as you see on the first one, China is about 2030. That may accelerate. One that's not on the list is Vietnam. They're really aggressively going towards 2025. Uh, governments like in the US federal government racing towards 2025. I mean, these are, this is what, two, two years out? That goes in a blink of an eye. Hell, it's almost 2024. So start, we need to start paying attention to this. But again, putting my business lens on, even though governments are not businesses, if you think about what business case they care about, this is what I've been able to home it down to. One, they want to provide uh, economic empowerment to everybody. As I mentioned at the beginning, not everyone in the world is connected to the network. I actually think last that I saw about half the world's population is still not connected, which means they're not part of the digital economy, which means we can't make sales taxes off of them. Again, looking at it from a business lens. Governments want to collect taxes so they can provide services. So it's in their best interest to get everybody on the digital economy in some shape, form, or fashion. Next, every country, how they're being measured, they want to be able to see how many PhDs they're providing, how many patents are being filed. Well, guess what? IPv6 is a rich, abundant resource. If I look at IPv6 as abundance, that means there's potential for innovation with it. There's a lot of innovation happening in the IETF. There's a lot of innovation happening in different pockets of the world uh, in different ways. So IPv6 is an enabler for that. And last but not least, every single economy in the world, every country wants to have some kind of initiative for e-government. Well, guess what? If you want to put this new service out there, we already saw all the costs associated with IPv4, if you can get an IPv4 address. So IPv6 really is going to be the catalyst to make a lot of these things happen. So if you're out there, you're part of the government, think about this. Especially here in the UK, I haven't seen a mandate for IPv6, but they may want to start thinking about all these things to try to push the envelope and create all these new things that could be possible. Now, changing gears a little bit, as Veronica mentioned, I do work for Cisco. Now, I'm not here to sell you on the Cisco Meraki platform, but I want to use it as a case study of what I've learned talking about business speak and how we can actually change the envelope. Because there may be some vendors out here that are making manufa manufacturing products just like we are, and that's okay. But here's the thing. When you can't beat them, because I used to be a customer, I couldn't get them to budge on anything I wanted for IPv6, I joined them. And now we're making the change, and this is what I'm about to explain to you guys. So as part of that transformation that I mentioned earlier in becoming an evangelist, I had to figure out what, how the business ticks. They were asking me, what is the business case for doing IPv6? So I had to figure out how do I help them solve some of these questions. And this is, by the way, n not all the questions that a typical project ma product manager asks, but these are the kind of things that we're getting asked, w whether to build the product or because of you're running an, a, a business like we saw earlier. But the one that's getting really interesting for me is that last one, the market access problem. As I indicated, with all these mandates, well, I hate paperwork. It's kind of cool that these mandates are out there because now I can say, you need to pay attention to this. If not, we can't sell anything. We can't provide a service. So that gets their attention because they have all these revenue projections that will be zero if we don't comply. The other interesting thing is we're trying to build for the masses, not for 
pockets. Sorry, Jen, I'm going to pick on you. Not for Google. That has deep pocketbooks, but we want to build for everyone in this room. Right? And that's a big challenge. Well, therein lies our problem. If you look back at this diagram that we started off with, the enterprise networks are the masses. They are the ones that are holding out. And by the way, they probably have gear that can run IPv6, that can run all these services. The problem is it's not automated. It's hard. They don't want change. There's so many, many reasons. And therein lies the opportunity for the Meraki platform, which is automating IPv6, IPv6 only for everyone. It's not just about having the feature but it's about having the feature automatically on, embracing this problem and making it available to everyone. So some of the outcomes of this statement, again, very different way of viewing it. This is not building a feature. This is about taking what we just went through in the last 20 minutes about thinking about the business, putting our business lens on to solve a problem and encourage product development to actually pursue this path. So what did this yield? This yielded a few design principles. This is not all the design principles, but it yielded a few kind of cool things to help with that transition to make it available for everyone, which is it's going to be always on. So please, do not call support. Tell them, how do I turn IPv6 off? You don't do that for IPv4, right? Don't expect it for IPv6. <laughs> so, oops, sorry. Didn't. It's going to be always on. Next. As I mentioned earlier, IPv6 provides simpler operations. So we're embracing that as part of the design philosophies to make operations simpler. And along the way, the embracement of IPv6 has actually benefited IPv4, which is really, really interesting. Again, part of that innovation, designing with abundance. And the example I just have right there, it's we're essentially treating uh, an IPv6 prefix as a container. So why, when you write security rules, IPv6 we know is changing. I might readdress one day. I might get a new prefix delegation. Well, I don't need to be updating my rules every single time. If I treat it as a container, that just means I'm automatically secure no matter how many times it changes, even if it changes once every hour. It doesn't matter. Again, part of the new way of thinking, to automate and make it easier for the masses to adopt in an automated way. So it's not as hard. And then. I had mentioned I hate paperwork. We all have to comply. We all have to do some kind of audit. All these privacy things that we keep hearing about about IPv6, well, we're automatically keeping a track for you. So if you get a DMCA complaint, which I think is US-based um, kind of a complaint that, hey, so you downloaded something illegally, and it comes with an IPv6 address, well, good luck trying to find it. Probably that address doesn't exist. Well. Now you have an automatic collection, and that's what we mean. And the goal is we're marching towards IPv6 only operations. We're there in some regards, we're not there in others, but the, as you guys can see, if you justify to the business that this is a need, that can yield very, very positive results. And I want to recommend that every one of you guys has different vendors, work with your vendors, show them that you actually have a need. There's a lot of good b examples that I gave out today. Use them to your advantage. Adapt them to your own business, your own vertical, because they need to start listening. Hell, we need to start listening. It's all of us collectively. So just as a little treat, I'm going to give you guys a little demo of what this looks like in real life. Uh, we can talk more offline, but the point is you get to see all these principles and practice. IPv6 on by default. You don't have to go tell your platform hey, turn on v6 for analytics, for tracking clients. This is on automatically. You can see the network has a lot of v6 in it. It's tracking where is it going? Am I going to Facebook? Am I going to Google? Am I going to it via v4, v6? How often? Again, I didn't have to go turn it on. All that I did was power it on and boom, it was on by default, which means less work for you guys, which means it should be a lot more attractive, which means the IPv6 translation should be a lot easier. On this specific example, prefix delegation, DHCP v6, uh, INA, all automatically turned on. You don't have to go tell it, hey, I need a hint for a slash 56. It's done. If I want to send stuff down the tunnel, it's done automatically as well. So again, these are the things that can make a business very attractive to solving their problem. So we can do it together. Treating things as containers.
instead of the old school way of thinking. And now I kind of hit this little treat here for my, my friend here, Jen. So she asked me, are you doing anything with IPv6 only? I said, in some platforms, this is specifically an access point. This one hasn't seen an IPv4 address in over four years now. So this is possible. And then on the audit front, for the security folks out there, we make it easier for you guys with v4, v6, tell you what the addresses are being used for, what purpose, which direction. Again, the point is, take your problem, put your business lens on, and solve it with v6. So as you saw, v6 is actually helping us innovate, including benefiting v4 in this case for a platform. Hopefully you enjoyed that. Now, as we get to the end, a few calls to action for the, the group. One, become that ally for the business. As I mentioned at the beginning, when I went from an enthusiast to an evangelist, it took me a few years. But during that transition, the business started inviting me to the table, asking my opinion, because you are there as a potential enabler to make those things that they want happen. And you have a secret weapon along your side, which is V6. So do not be shy about it. And I underline explicitly, because do not be shy about it. Yes, our users should not care that it's doing V6 or V4. They just care that it works. But you need to be, let the business know. We have a tool. It's called IPv6. We can make it happen together. So do not be shy. And if you don't believe me, come February 1st, if you don't take action, you will stop feeling the pinch. You <laughs> So it will start costing you money. And with that, thank you very much. Thank you for coming on this journey, for viewing things differently from a business case. We have a couple minutes for questions. Thank you.